so I got into jazz uh, when I was like 15 or 16. But before that, I was very much like rock and pop and uh, loads of other things that I was really interested in, like funk and lots of things. But jazz was like the one thing I felt at that age I hadn't really got under my belt just yet. So it became like a little project to get to get it together a bit more. And then it suddenly became my sort of passion very quickly. And my, my older brother is a uh, tennis sax player, so he's been a massive fan of jazz ever since day one. So jazz has always been playing in the house and him practicing. And I'd be like listening, like, oh, that's pretty cool actually you know uh, so then I started checking out the drummers on the albums that Tom was listening to and yeah just it just ever since then it's just been non-stop like a love and passion for it I remember this one time when I heard uh, one of my favourite drummers, Bill Stewart, for the first time. And that was on an album called, uh, I think it was On The Call, uh, by Seamus Blake. And when I first heard Bill for the first time, it was, it was like mind-blowing and just everything I ever could imagine, like from a jazz drummer, was, I, I don't know, it just it made that connection. And ever since then, I was like, okay, maybe I should go back and like do some history and do some homework first. I tried to go back to like, I don't know, well like 20s and then went to 30s and then also like checked out like the, the bop guys, so like the bebop guys, so I'd talk about Max Roach, you know, Philly Joe Jones and all these guys and then I'd like skip forward to maybe like the hard bop era, like the 50s, so that would be like your, I don't know, like Jimmy Cobb, your Billy Higgins vibe um, and Oh yeah, Max. Max was for all of them really, but like Max was a massive hard pop guy as well, as in Max Roach. Yeah. And then um, go to the post pop guys, so that's like 50s, 60s you know, onwards, you know. So then that's when like Tony came into it, and like Elvin, and you know all these guys, and like Jack Dejanette, um, who are, I'm just all of these names I'm saying now. I'm like just such a huge fan of. I, I love them all, and, like Roy Haynes, you know. I just keep. I could just keep going. I think of it as like evolution of like the playing. So like when it comes to like just vocabulary in general, um, those bop guys got stuff from the trad guys and then our bop guys got stuff from the pop, uh, bop guys and then elaborated with it. Post bop guys took everything and just made it into their own and that's, that's just been an ongoing thing ever since. But the brush playing, it's very much been, you know, kind of, it was a simple thing to keep time, you know, and um, maybe like chat, chat sort of, uh, you know, almost like a what was going to be a backbeat sort of thing. Um, uh, but then as we're going on, you know, swing has just been elaborated into what what was then the ride pattern, you know, so ding, 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 ding you know, which is Kenny Clark. So Kenny Clark was the inventor of that and he actually got fired for doing that. Um, but then people started incorporating that into their brush plan and started sweeping with it a bit more and you know bit by bit people were just taking different bits and then comping came into it you know the odd snare hits here and there so it'll be comping with the sweeping patterns and and now it's just endless so then you get people like Ed Thigpen who was like such a huge revolutionary um, brush player you know and then my favorite brush players today are people like Jeff Hamilton and um, well just yeah I think Jeff is one of my favorites When I first heard it, uh, it was just the pure um, emotion, and like you could, you could hear everything. Everything was just so. What am I trying to say? It's like everything was played with a purpose, and and I never heard like comping with the hi hat as much as he does, you know, with the left foot. And I thought some of that was just you know pretty explosive, and I thought maybe that's something I could get into a bit more, you know, and. With Bill, I love, I mean, I love anal analyzing everyone's playing, anyone, any drummer I love, I like to like transcribe, um, whether that means like listening to a record and learning the drum solo bit by bit and then putting it all together at the end, 
and then maybe writing it down on manuscript paper just just for memory's sake you know so you can refer back to it if you want to in years to come you know but you know it all, you, that could also be on a YouTube video you know, now, now that we have YouTube and all this you can just watch a video and slow it down if you want to and you just see oh what was that two bars there you know and just get that together and look at the sticking you know and all this and just the phrasing and the orchestration you put that all together and then all of a sudden you've memorised the whole drum solo and then what, I, what I've been doing is playing along to the record and putting like side by side of me doing it and you know like with my feel. I think the rise cymbal is the most important instrument in the whole set of drums. Um, I think if you haven't got a strong ride beat when it comes to jazz, then you haven't got much else. You know, um, I feel like it's the main voice of who you are and what, it's what supports the band. It's the whole pulse. And if you haven't got a strong quarter, enough, quarter note pulse, then it's it's not going to get you the gig. Um, I know people say like if you if you just play really strong quarter notes and nothing else. You're going to get some gigs, you know. Whereas if you've got all these chops and then really kind of an inconsistent quarter note pulse, then you know what's the point? You know, um, it's what makes it groove. So I always, I spent a lot of time on, you know, just we said like the other night, 40 BPM, maybe like 30 or 40 beats per minute, and just really hone in on making every single quarter note, you know, consistent in terms of like volume and um, sound and time as well, you know. Um, so I'd be just sitting there for hours, drove my parents mad, <laughs> you know, just, I would do it for like three hours, you know, that, or maybe on a practice pad as well, because if it's late at night, which I used to do all the time, because if you couldn't play past a certain time, I'd be on it till the early hours of the morning just doing this, you know, and just really getting that together, and then maybe you could incorporate the skip beat in between, um, but yeah, that's really, to get that together is really important, really consistent, um, really important to get that consistent together.
Doug Barford. That wasn't bad in his first thing, was it? Um, so thank you very much, well done, John.